Here we are, and welcome to an ineffable episode of the Friday Night Movie Podcast, because once again, podcast dreams come true. We have the creators, the hosts, I think my pop culture soulmates, we'll see what they think after they spend an hour with us, the hosts of Podcats, a podcast dedicated to the show Cats, which everybody knows I love, EJ Dixon and Dan Alexander. You're both here. We are so grateful. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. This is so exciting. We're so excited. Thank you so much. We are thrilled and we're going to go deep into Cats and properly introduce you in a moment. But before we do that, I just, we always like to update people with what's happening in the family. And this morning, we all attended the virtual bat mitzvah of our cousin. And Becky and I live now next door to each other. And so we were assembled with my parents and all of our kids who had a sleepover last night. Um, the ages range from one through nine, multiple dogs. And towards, you know, we left our camera on so we could get credit for having shown up to the virtual bat mitzvah, right? Because if you have no camera on, then mm, were you really there? So we left it on the whole time. And I think we were, you know, we were getting into it. It was a really good bat mitzvah as far as virtual bat mitzvahs go. And, you know, a little singing along here and there. And at the end of it, um, I forget which wasn't a Don Alam, but it was one of the grand finale songs of this synagogue service. Becky's daughter, her older daughter, three years old, was just super into it. She was boogieing. <laughs> boogieing in front of the family and then dropped her pants and it took us a second to re remember that we were on live stream with the a entire synagogue person, like, <laughs> of the family then the whole synagogue could but, access. you know there's a lot of gallery view happening so who knows if but it wasn't saying. like a half second it was her pants <laughs> have been it, dropped. It took us everyone is laughing i'm on the other side of like the house and then i hear instead of one of the five adults go and put her pants on. They just shout for me, Becky, Becky, Mary's naked on Zoom. She's naked on Zoom. <laughs> so then I have to then run across the house and scoop her up. So, but we weren't sure anybody saw. And then at the end of the service, while everybody was allowed to unmute and squish their mazel tovs, the rabbi stops everything and pipes up and says, I just want to give a shout out to the Corman slash Cooperman house. Becky's last name is Cooperman. Uh, the Corman slash Cooperman house, because they were the most lively house during this bat mitzvah. So we felt that was as confirmation as we wanted. Lily, yeah. you, you were watching from Spain. Did you catch how lively the scene was in our house? I, I didn't see her tush, but... I to appreciate be, that to clarify, there. she thinks showing her butt to people is the funniest joke in the world. So, I mean, I mean <laughs> it, it, it wasn't kind of that still random is. that like, it happened. She it kind of like, funny. I mean, I feel like a good, you know, a good you know, mooning, like, mooning good, can, is still pretty Still funny. gets a laugh. Uh, uh, all right. So that's, that's, I was just going to sum up the whole family, how we're doing. Now I want to get to our guests. Um, uh, uh, I don't know where to start, but I'll start with EJ because EJ was the person that I was able to find on Twitter and was kind enough to respond. I'm sure like you leave your contact information for like journalistic tips and story pitches, not uh, guys in their forties writing to you, begging to be a guest <laughs> on your show. Um, we are not the first. Uh, really? Oh, now I'm kind of embarrassed. Well, <laughs> E e or less, I think you should be less embarrassed. No, no, no. I, that makes it more embarrassing. I thought I was the only one. Um, EJ <laughs> Dixon is uh, an author, a journalist for Rolling Stone. You write awesome articles on culture um, and and on some really cool topics. And I think your your writing is great and it's edgy and fun. And and so everyone should check out EJ's articles. But she's also a cat's aficionado. So welcome, welcome EJ. Thank and, you. And then I'll welcome Dan Alexander, who is a mysterious musician, is the best way I'll describe it. Just because we we all collectively tried to find you on Instagram <laughs> and found so many of you that yeah. we I really mean, were not sure how to nail it down. <laughs> the last cat's tweet I sent to EJ, I just figured I, I figured this one author, this kind of liberal author named Dan Alexander was you and just started copying him on it just because I wanted to be respectful. It clearly wasn't you. It's not me. Yeah. Dan Alexander is a uh, fake name because 
I'm a jazz musician. Uh, I live in Brooklyn, and in the circles that I run in, admitting to liking cats is maybe the worst thing I could possibly do. And I, I, when we when we first started the podcast, I decided that there was no way I could use my real name because I'll never work again. So. Wait, would... So now there's some guy, Dan Alexander, out there that everybody in his world thinks loves cats. Maybe, maybe. I don't know if he's ever been. I don't know if he's the first person to tag him, but I really wonder. If he ever finds out who I am, he'll <laughs> just really start good. tagging him all the time. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's actually a great. Wait, what instrument do you play? Just so I. I play the bass. Oh, awesome. Cool. Oh, all right. Awesome. So. Shai is a that, musician as well. Oh yeah, I play the drums. He's a drummer. I call myself a musician. Oh, You're a percussionist. Cool. I think, that, I He's think a there's, I think he there's a distinction between musician and someone who plays music, and I am the play music person. Um, so I think that's a great place to start, though, because I feel like there is a certain amount of gleeful cat shaming that goes on. Like I felt like when that movie came out. Every snarky person was like, I, I have been so nice all year. It's been such a hard year. Oh, no, no, this wasn't. No, this was the previous year. Sorry. Well, the last pre, pre, four pre years pandemic. before the, the last pandemic four years have been hard. Rough, right? I'm sorry. The, like the last four years have yeah. been rough. And they were like, I'm going to write. I'm just going to come up with every mean and every every mean headline. And every headline was like, it's like when people start tweeting the snarky jokes and everyone's just trying to say the meanest, funniest thing. And it sort of loses its it, it loses its um, effect. I feel like that's what all of the cats articles and headlines are about. What do you all think about cats shaming? How do you react to it? Like Dan's in a fear for his career. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I, I wasn't in the same position as Dan because I'm not a musician, and I'm also. Like I have sort of built a brand as much as insofar as I have a brand, which like I don't really like I would say that a lot of my brand is like people think I'm sort of contrarian and ironic and I <laughs> I like things, you know, for attention. And so it wasn't like it, it's, it wasn't that big a deal for me to like come out as a Cats fan or to start a Cats podcast. I feel like people who know me well would like expect that. Um but so I didn't really face the brunt of the shaming, nor do I really feel shame. Um, I guess after the This American Life episode came, no, I mean, even then, Dan, did you get shame? Like, did you get attacked and, on social media or like yelled at? They or, can't like, find him. They can't, yeah, they don't they know who I am. They don't know who I am. <laughs> oh, right, right. They can't find so, him. They attacked him. So, and Alexander. But, yeah, I would, I would say, I mean, since coming out as a Cats fan, like I've received like, fairly little amount of shaming but i don't know if that's because of like the like the people in our social circle like well i mean we what we can say is that our friends and and romantic partners thought it was pretty fucking ridiculous can we can we say f on here yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you, you definitely, can, you can they, definitely. Thought, they thought it was pretty ridiculous even but, even yeah. when i try to keep my sisters under control lily will drop f bombs no, so it doesn't we're an explicit true. podcast <laughs> Yes. Not oh, I, I won't say F. I'll, I'll stay away from F. You can yeah, say I mean, F. I, I would say that the shaming that we actually got was like primarily from people like close to us who know us well enough to know that this is something that we would do. Oh, okay. You know? Like they but, thought it was pretty silly. But you said something about yourself being a contrarian. And I know from listening to you, you've talked about how that's your reputation. But but your love of cats is not ironic. Not at it all. Is, it's no. that <laughs> it, it's that joyful, unironic love that I know I have and my sisters have. And when I try to explain to people, I will defend this movie. I say I will unironically defend this. This is not like a tongue in cheek thing where I'm no, breaking the fourth wall. I love it. What do you think about the people who actually do the shaming? Like, do you think like like we I've we've posited Becky's posited many times that they have like lost an element of the wonder in their life. Yes. And that's they, why they're doing it. Do you have any judgment on the on the cats shamers? I just don't think they understand the context. And this is like a huge part of what we talk about in the podcast. Like, I don't think they understand the context in which cats was developed and like what the movie was supposed to be and what the musical was supposed to be. Like, it seemed like all of the reviews that came out were like, oh, this is, like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, there's no plot. Like, the, this right. is about a bunch of, and like, that's what the music yeah. is. Like, you just need to understand that and accept that and then you can enjoy right. it. Right. Uh, if that's what's hanging you up, if the plot is what's hanging you up, you've missed the point. Exactly. Yes. 
You're right. It delivers on its province. Like I'll read the reviews, the negative reviews, and without the adjectives, just like the facts of the things that they use to justify the negative, I'll be like, yep, 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 yeah. All those things are in it. That's why it's awesome. Like it delivers, totally delivers on its on its promise. Um, all right, let's talk about, or I'm going to, I'm going to, Lily and Becky do observe this phenomenon with me and my house and my wife who like cats was not something she knew about in our relationship before we, we got together, but uh, we have since taken our kids to see it twice. And we had that awesome, the stage DVD, you know, the, the one from the nineties, um, which uh, I know you, I love, by the way, my favorite episode of podcasts is when you talk about Andrew Lloyd Webber watching, doing the director's commentary on no. that. That's my favorite episode because I've watched that so many times. Um, <laughs> Lily, Lily and Becky, what do you observe? Like my family, the pro the, the experience my family has gone through here and how, so and do you was... see any similarities between us and our guests? I, I feel like there's a few things going on here. You, can, you convert the children first. Yes. And then the spouse has no choice. And yes. that's like how, that's how you, that's how, that's, that's how you the, get it. That's the, that's, yes. that's the strategy, and, the plan of attack. You get I realize, the children obsessed with the soundtrack. I realize this is so, before I had my first kid, Shy, I was at, I must've been at Shy. So this is now like a bunch of years ago. I was at Shy's house. I was sleeping in his basement, visiting and I wake up to like on this like mattress on the floor, I wake up to a tiny human on top of me, like sitting there, like snuggled on top of me with a somewhat she had put the TV on and had put cats. And you trained my kids at a young age to be able to use the TV. It's, an, yes. it's a life skill. <laughs> and so she had put the DVD on and I'm like waking up to like the Jellico ball or whatever. And I was like, what is happening in here right now? It's like seven o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning. And she just looks at me. She's like, cats. Like, Duh. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm here for it. Sure. And then I remember being like, Shia, like, what is she doing just watching cats by herself so early in the morning? And he's like, you got to start them young. Are you so kidding So that's me? what they do. You start them when they're young. You indoctrinate them. You get the children on board. And then the spouse will be alienated if they don't also get on Join. the train yeah so that's that that's what we've witnessed and it seems to be effective both i think for cult leaders and for cats lovers so, so there you go so, so ej it, when you appeared on this american life which is uh which is i have to tell you i like podcasts a thousand times more than that snooze of a show so i actually like um, I, sorry, is that contrary? Very nice of you to say. I'm, I don't, I don't agree, but very nice of you to say. <laughs> no, no, sorry. I, 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 That's Shai's contrary. One, one of the jokes in our family was that like, my sister was like, you have to listen to this American Life bit. And I'm like, oh, do I have to? I just want to listen to more podcast episodes. But I listened to your interview, which is, it's a phenomenal segment. And obviously that's a great show. Um, uh, it, um, and uh, I, 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 um, you talk about your spouse, you talk about Alex and his experience. So now he's, he doesn't hate it as much. What is his favorite element or song of the show? Like, do you ever catch him humming a little Buster for Jones or anything like that? Not Buster for Jones. Um, although my son once called him Buster for Jones, uh, which he was really not flattered by, um, really not amused by it. No, Alex likes old Deuteronomy. Um, really, really? you'll belt out old. De yeah, I mean it's my favorite song. Too. Like you'll belt out old Deuteronomy. Really, that's yeah. your really? favorite song. Both of you, that's your favorite song. I think so. Yeah, it's beautiful. That's amazing. I just, I've never, I like. I mean, old Deuteronomy is cool, but like old Deuteronomy is definitely not like when when people talk about the sort of like juke, uh, you know, like the sort of like top hits that people you know hum from Cats. You don't necessarily hear people doing the i mean i feel like that thing. shows like a deep uh connection in love it's not just about the the pop hits it's about some of the more emotional ballads That's, and what about go. and what about and what about your what about so old deuteronomy is your favorite dan what's your favorite song my favorite is the american version of mungo jerry and rumple teaser the one that was so not for dan. yeah there's a hundred percent i mean I, I it's not my favorite song but the british version is Terrible. Oh, I, awful. I remember buying. I own. We only own the. We own a couple versions. We own the Broadway and the selections from the Broadway growing up. And I bought the London one because I was like, oh, you know, I'm a completist. I want to hear the different versions. And is it Elaine Page who sings "Memory"? I wanted to have 
like that that version or uh, right is that her name the woman who sings the yeah yeah, yeah. uh the kind of definitive version and and uh i'm like all right getting so excited and then i got to that first mungo jerry and then it actually made me doubt the rest of that version of it <laughs> i was afraid to keep listening to it all right so there's a few it. strange things on the, on the on that original london cast album there are a few really strange uh no, choices yeah. that 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 were improved for broadway which is what well we'll get to the, we'll get to the film later but okay and, and also the opening number i think is jellicle song for I, jellicle I think song. yeah that opening number is special Th- that's my favorite that'll that'll always be my yeah. favorite forever i still remember i was 11 years old 1991 uh, our parents was the first Broadway show we ever went to. We grew up in Canada and our parents drove us down to New York and we took the, the subway from Brooklyn where our grandparents lived, went to the Winter Garden Theater, which in my mind was enormous. I have no idea if it was bigger than the it is. Neil Simon it is. Theater. Then, right, the Neil Simon Theater is where it went back. And in my mind, you know, I was 11, but I, I didn't know any songs going into the, to the play. And for me, when I hear a song and I can remember it from that moment, when they go into that opening, the, the opening number and the moves and, and the dance moves and the, you know, the when air they, guitar they, or whatever. When they, they walk do. down the, the, the aisles. I just, I remember that. You were 11. So I was perfectly. eight. I was, I was, yeah, I was six. I remember my perfectly. mind was blown. And I didn't quite blown. understand that they were people and not cats. Like I didn't understand what they were. So it felt incredibly real to me. Well, you were six. That, so. I was six. Yeah, it was felt so real to me. It was so, it was quite so, a magical experience. All right, so Becky, what is your favorite song then? All these years. Um, it must. It's Mistopheles. It me too. Has been. I was it can't say not that be Mistopheles. I was. Too, I, it's it's that, that age, like eight and six. Mistopheles just gets you. It's just gotta like, be. Yeah. He's so magical. Sticks with me. And so magical. He's so magical. So magical. So magical. He, it, it is that one. That one's great. Our dad had, I don't know if you all know that there is a children's book version of that. There's like an, uh, a painted, you know, and it has, let's Mungo just Jerry. assume they know everything. About we have the McCavity. Um, we have the McCavity children's book version. We don't have the Mr. Mistopheles oh. children's book version. So the Mistopheles but. one has like a second part at the end, I guess, fill it out. Cause it was too short. That is Mungo Jerry and rubble teaser. And our dad yeah. collects children's books. And that's like one of his, Prize, Aww, prize that's such a nice hobby it's a mm-hmm. it's it's a it's it's really cool he has a really nice he's a really fun collection when, we, when the grandkids visit he always pulls them out and he'll sometimes lend them to people to give them life lessons um which is <laughs> cool. he's, he's i wouldn't say he's like old deuteronomy our dad but but he's you know, not he's, not old not deuteronomy <laughs> um and i i do want to get to the differences of the movie but what i would love to do next if you all are up for it is Usually we would say this towards the end, but like I said, we feel like we know you. We just feel like you're automatically part of the Friday Night Movie family. Um, We have a series of games, bits, recurring things we do on the show um, uh, that all of our guests end up playing along with. And we would love to play some of those with you right now. And we're in, and in some ways, like, if you want to give context to a character in the context of the show, that would probably be good because most people who listen to this podcast might not know all the different Well, might not know the amount we know about cats, cats, but also the explanation sometimes of cats to me is just as engaging and funny as talking about, like, I also love cats parody, by the way, like things that make fun of cats are, are awesome to me too. I I, like, I I just love all of it. Um, So we'll start off in, in, you're up for it. Uh, you're nodding, but yeah, of course, okay. yeah, okay. no, I, I was just, yes, it makes sense to explain the context because obviously not everybody is familiar with yeah. Alonzo and Jemima, and you will explain. Uh, well, <laughs> Jemima, I, that's actually, you know, the whole Jemima syllabub thing is a really interesting question overall. Um, but let's just start start in an easy place. We do. We usually have our MVPs, our LVPs, and our MIPs, which are your most valuable player, your least valuable player, and your most improved player. Now we'll talk about our performer, and that's in a TV show or a movie or, or a series or something like that. But we're going to change it for today. It's going to be MVC, most valuable cat, least valuable cat, most improved cat. EJ, who are, who is your most valuable cat? You can give us all three. You can give us one. We can come back to you. Who is your most valuable cat? And it does not have to be a named cat with the, uh, you know, with a song. Just any of the cats in the show. My most valuable cat is probably Rum Tum Tugger. 
Um, because hmm. cats is so much. Rum Tum Tugger is the horny cat who uh, um, so it has intercourse. Um, <laughs> yeah, he hasn't. He he uh, he has intercourse. Like uh, during the show, because that, that's I will say I have well, a naive. He has like like sexual like exploits during the show. I don't know if it's full like copulation. But you know that he has intercourse behind the scenes. Like you know he oh, does. Yeah, yeah. He has slept with more than one of the main female cats for sure. Yes, and the male cat and the male and and the male cats right. for sure. It's implied. It's implied. Um, because I feel it's like awful, so yes. much of cats is like the aggressive sexuality which is like oddly incompatible for a show about cats but also like works and like and for the, children too. yeah but it works you know and that and and rum tum tugger is like key to that and my least valuable cat is probably like a heretical answer um but i i would i'm gonna go with victoria i think victoria is the least valuable cat so now just just to be clarified victoria everyone is played by francesca hayward in the movie that is the white cat she's kind of like the audience avatar in the movie but in the play she doesn't sing she's always cast by like an incredible dancer is is the reason rooted in like the original victoria and just not having a song and having to sit through the solo dance or is it just the personality like what what what's your problem with victoria my problem with victoria and this really reflects how like how much I'm and how I how analytical I am about cats, which is like a problem. But like I, my problem with Victoria is more like for narrative reasons. I think she serves the same role as Jemima, which is another cat does, um, played uh, originally by Sarah Brightman in the original cast. Um, and they're both supposed to be like sort of these avatars of like innocence and purity, and they kind of both essentially serve the same role. So I'm just like, one of them has to go, you know, like. And we'll take the one that doesn't sing part of memory. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That, cool. That's heretical. I, I know a lot of people love the white cat. So could, could we take the aside though? And just note that in American productions, Jemima is not called Jemima. She's called syllabub most of the time. That's right. Which I think is for um, racial reasons. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't yeah. know for sure, but it makes sense because it's it would in an American context, it's pretty insensitive to have. Yeah, derogatory. Yeah. yeah. So that character, that character. But so if you're listening and you are going through the cat's list, that's the <laughs> that's the difference. But she originally was called Jemima. Um, how about you? Oh, and what's your most improved cat from the beginning of the play to the end of the play, or for maybe like the entire time you've been loving cats? Like for me. I would say Victoria, because of the movie, is my most improved cat. Because she's like, I could not care for her at all originally, but I actually think Francesca Hayward is like one of the brightest spots of the movie. Absolutely. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, most improved cat. I mean, the obvious answer is Grizabella, right? Oh. Mm. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, I don't know if there's anything think about that. And that's because of her arc in the in the story? Yes. It, yeah, exactly. Okay. Cool. I mean, she starts out literally a sex worker cat in the trash, and then she ascends. <laughs> well, when you put it that way, which we're we're gonna have a section about questions for you guys about <laughs> your podcast about cats. I have a I need I'm have I have had like a moment listening to you, and where I was just like, wait, Grizabella is supposed to be a prostitute? Like I talking like i just is not i didn't understand Are, that and i i needed to like take a beat to like reabsorb my entire understanding of the show my relationship to the show is very innocent and asexual and only in like later i thought like, she was like a fallen people, like so, anyway we can get into that baby. what where did she fall from no like she was like a like a so, supposedly like a like a famous cat <laughs> that was like beloved by all but was like maybe mean to people and then everyone turned on her i didn't understand she was a sex worker cat <laughs> well she's a sex so, worker cat and and you can tell from the lyrics of one of the songs they talk about all of these places where grizabella hangs out and these are all right. that were notorious like prostitution haunts during T.S. Eliot's well, time. This makes sense the way you explain it to me as an adult, but I saw the show when I was six and my entire life, I, that, I had a very different perception of her. And that's, that's fine. You know, like I'm supportive of that, of whatever career or path she was on. That's fine. <laughs> I don't, it's not a judgment. It's more just like, um, like this, uh, a, a losing of my innocence as an adult in understanding 
certain aspects of the show. There all we right. go. Okay. All right, Dan, we're, we're, we're your most valuable cat. I'm going to have to say Monka Strap. Yes, that's mine. Yeah, he's the most valuable cat. Um, for Explain. one, he's, he's the protector of the kittens. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and that comes directly from the, I forget his name, the guy who plays him in the 1998 Harry, uh, version. Oh, no, Harry Groner is the original one. I don't know who the yeah. current one is. but um, So if you watch the behind the scenes good. of that, you find out some really important uh, like behind the scenes character stuff. Um, so he's the protector of the kittens. He's the narrator of the show. He is very much involved in the fight against Macavity. Oh, yeah. Um, like a Second very in player. command. I, I don't know if either of you read comic books, but to me, he's kind of like the Cyclops to Deuteronomy's Professor X. Uh -huh. That's how, like, I, I have a, like, uh, you know, like everyone has their own head cannon. I have a, like, the cats are kind of like the X Men thing in my brain. And he very much is the Cyclops of the crew. Like, he kind of, he's like the COO of Jellicle Town. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I could see that completely. Amazing. All right. Your least valuable cat. Least valuable, I'm gonna have to say Jelly Lorum. Jelly Lorum. Uh, Jelly Lorum, yeah. Je Jelly no Lorum. can say their name. Who is Jelly Lorum? She sings Buster Per Jones. She's like the other, there, there's a few of the, the adult female cats, and she's sort of like the, she's not like as interesting as Demeter and Bob Ballerina. There's in the show? There's like non adult no, cats in the show? No, but Dan brought this up on the podcast multiple times. This obviously means a lot to you. <laughs> That in the lore, or the guy play, who played him, right? Said, yeah, saying that he's the protector of the kittens. No, but Jelly like, Lorem is a female cat. Kit. No, no, but Monka Strap. Uh, Monka Strap. Monka Strap. So why Jelly no, Lorem? But there's no kittens in that. Like, actual show. You don't like Buster for Jones? Like, what's your. Just Buster for Jones. Also, Jelly Lorem is Gus the Theater Cat's guardian, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, I just, I just find it. I just, well, yes, one, I don't like Buster for Jones. I find that to be I the weak. Yeah, he's here. my least valuable. Least favorite, at least valuable. And, and then especially like, casting after, James Corden as him, yeah. and then he just like doubled down on Lisa. Yeah. And and then add on the fact that then he shat on the movie. Oh yeah, afterwards that, like a triple threat. When, it, like, when that came out, and then I, it, it, it made me like him even less. Yeah. That best of Jones. No. Just so unprofessional, like really bad, oh. really poor taste. Yeah, um, the whole thing. Makes but even so, good. so I don't miss. I don't miss. There's, there's no Jelly Orm in the movie, and I certainly don't miss her. I don't think that she's in. A, she doesn't. Her character doesn't really serve a purpose. I'd I much think rather see ageist just the response. Then. Sorry. I think you're being ageist. <laughs> About what? About Jelly Lorem. Ageist. Yeah, because she's an older lady cat. Well, so is Grizabella. So is um. Well, yeah, you're right. There aren't a lot of old lady cats. No Deuteronomy in the movie, sure. But maybe it speaks more to the author and their perception of older ladies, older lady cats, than it does uh -huh. to Dan's. But Jenny ageism. any dots, Jenny any dots is. Or maybe they old, feed right? each other. It, the, I don't also, know if she's old, but she's like borderline my next in line for least valuable. Sure. <laughs> in the movie, for sure. Yeah. In the movie, yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. And your most improved cat. My most improved. Um, that one's tricky. I mean, I, Rizabella was the first thing that came into my head. Um, but I would say maybe Syllabub Jemima is the, is, is the most improved cat. Over the course of the show, she's the one who learns the most and sort of the one who has the, the biggest journey. Besides, well, she goes along the journey with Grizabella, I think. Which they kind of give that to, to Victoria in the film, right? They exactly, really do give yeah. her a part, totally. Yeah. And now I see more of EJ's resentment towards, towards Victoria. It's stealing. redundant. Just like choose one, you know? Like they just both serve the exact same purpose. I like Victoria. I like. I, like, I disagree. I like Victoria on the show. Uh, I so all right. We're gonna play a, a quick round of of our signature game now. Buy, rent, meh. So think of it. That there are similar games out there, but this is how we play it on our show because we like to use the theme of like renting movies, like from the eighties or nineties, depending on when you, you're. You both seem old enough to have rented a movie from a place, yes, but there there are movie that you would. There's things that you would buy. There's things that, ah, it's just a renter. These days, maybe that's a streamer. And then meh 
can be whatever you define it to. It can be the least good, but it can also just be indifferent to it, right? So you get get to play with that one. And uh, so let's talk ships, like right? relationships, which like my sisters don't even know who I'm talking about. You're when have, I yeah. when I they don't know which. I mean, part. I know these different cats. I just don't understand. Like no part of me has ever absorbed that there were ships in this or could have pieced ships together. I, I mean, so. I, 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 so, and, and if there's one that you want to switch, but like, like meaning like, like my mind always goes, Monkus, Straff and Demeter go together. Rum Tum Tugger and Bomb Ballerina go together. And then there's also the question of Monkus, Straff and Rum Tum Tugger, but you're suggesting Mistopheles and Rum Tum Tugger. So, you know, you can, you can switch these around if you want to, but those are the three couples that I would say, which one would you buy? Which one would you rent? And which one would you meh? Um, uh, or maybe there's one of these you don't buy. So you're like, I'm going to meh that one because it should be this one. Which ones did you list? Did you list Rum Tum Tugger and Mist- Rum Stoffelies? I know them by like their ship names. Rum okay. All right. Oh, I don't know them by their ship names. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Mungusstrap and Demeter, do they count as a ship? I always see them as a potential ship. Like they're sort of two adult cats. She's finished with her macavity or you know her post macavity trauma or whatever it is that she has issues with him. Um, and she's not going back to Rumtum Tuggerville. So that's why I think Mungusstrap and Demeter. And then Rumtum Tugger and Bomb Ballerina. I feel like um, she's the one who right like is he drops right when he goes no and he drops her in the in the play and then monkey strap and rum tum tugger i just thought they would make a nice couple but i have no idea if they're uh, actually like in the ship lore a thing i would say i met about monkey strap and demeter um i i am open to the idea of bombalerina and rum tum tugger like i feel like they you know they vibe together reasonably well so maybe that would fall under the category of rent but i wouldn't say like i ship them super hard um I'm a, I'm a Rumstopheles girl myself. Like I'm oh. ride or die Rumstopheles for it. sure. Got it. Okay. I, cool. I, I just want to stop you for one second. I think it's Tugophiles. It is not Tugophiles. <laughs> yeah, you have not oh, seen one of those Tumblr names. fan oh. art, the erotic Tumblr fan art <laughs> from Tugophiles. <laughs> like I have, where Rum Tum Tugger has his arms around Mistopheles, like from behind, and they're both shirtless. <laughs> nice. Shirtless. That's awesome. I have the, they see again. I've very innocent relationship with cats. So I have to check that out. <laughs> um, Dan, how about you? Which which ship do you buy, rent, or meh? Or do you want you can insert your own? I'm gonna say meh for Monkey Strap and Demeter. I think it's Demeter and Alonzo. If you watch really closely. Oh, mm. Demeter and Alonzo. Okay, very cool. That's Who's yeah, Alon- Alonzo. Who Alonzo are these cats who don't have the, songs. Doesn't sing, but he's one of the cats that fights McCavity and is also a protector. Yes. <laughs> yes. He's a tall one. He's got usually got like like um like a pat like one one black sort of okay. circle around one. Similar eye. markings to Mistopheles. Yes. Okay. But not, not this so Dan, can you tell the story about your dog and Alonzo? I, uh, you know, like so many, I adopted a pandemic puppy. Mm-hmm. Um, but the first one I was going to adopt, it was two dogs. That I was one I, tr- I applied to adopt and I didn't get it. It was a black and white dog who I was going to name Alonzo. And then the dog who I did get is also a black and white puppy who I was tr- dying to name Alonzo, but my fiance wouldn't let me. What did you name it? Ollie. Okay. Oh, okay, so close. You just kind of snuck it in there. That's like kind of my it. friend wanted to name, like we were trying to convince my friend to name his kid, his second kid, Levon, after Levon Helm, because he's a huge fan of the band. And then the kid's middle name is Lev. And like after everything was minted, we were like, we, we were telling his wife, we're like, awesome, he named it Levon. And she was like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if she's upset. She's a big Levon Helm fan too. Um, all right, we'll play one more by Renter Man, and then let's get into the movie versus the show. And then after that, I would so start germinating in your brains as we finish up when we're talking about movie in the show, the movie in the film, I'm sorry, the movie in the Broadway show. Um, think about how you would pitch your sequel to Cats the movie. I, I pitched this a couple of weeks ago on our show to everyone's dismay. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so by Renter Man, the non cat based songs, which I think should, you know, get a lot of like meaning the cat names. And uh, I'm going to leave out Jellicle Cats, uh, the, the intro, because that one's just 
I don't, I don't want to know if you don't like it. So I was just like, I'm afraid to know if that's not one of your favorites, but we've got the journey to the heavy side layer, which I, until I saw the movie thought was the heaven side layer. We have the showstopper memory. And then I'm going to throw in beautiful ghosts, the Taylor Swift, Andrew Lloyd Webber collaboration that I think should have won an Academy award uh, for best song. Uh, the the addition to the movie sung by Victoria. Dan, you have to take this because I know you have strong feelings. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm going to say by um, Journey to the Heaviside Layer, I love, I love. It's amazing. Um, it's amazing. Rent memory, which is like memories. It's it's amazing, but it's just we all. It's just obvious, you know. We all know about memory, right. and you don't like you don't have to buy it because it's just everywhere, and you know you don't. It's like you're gonna hear it playing everywhere anyway. <laughs> um, you don't need to own that song. And That's then great. beautiful ghost to me is mad. It wasn't my thing. I didn't love it. Okay, cool. All right, EJ, over to you. Um. I would agree with that ranking. Okay. I think that's I th- I I think I, I'm aligned with that ranking. And I'm, maybe behind that ranking. I'm a big man on memory because A, I I did not know the song was in cats, but it was in every Jewish day school like song review that we did. Like we'd be doing like Shabbat services for all the parents, and there'd always be one kid who gets to do memory as a solo. <laughs> Never understood. So why. true, but right? why? There's always one kid in your grade with a great voice, and Alex Butvinick, the uh, the I always music thought it was teacher. like a Barbara Streisand song because right. of that. I just it, assume that. I, I was very thrown off when it was even in when Cats I saw it in Cats. Yeah. I still thought it was like, oh, that's so weird. They put that like Jewish Barbara Streisand song <laughs> in Cats. I remember, like as a child because I had a so question. yeah. Um, so did they replace the words in your school with like Shab- like Jewish references or like Shabbat? No, or- no, it just oh I just I thought it was honestly like I thought it was like some sort of like sunrise sunset fiddler on the roof. I was gonna say that's the song yeah. that I, that it comes to mind. But- it's like that vibe, but it's just a, a, a but sun- yeah. Time, oh, also a like, lot no, of sunrise sunsets. We didn't have many like funny parody Jewish songs like with word switch that we had in our in our school. Like it was like a straight performance. Anyways, so memory, but I, I love Beautiful Ghosts. I feel like I was so surprised. I didn't hear it before I saw the movie. And I feel like it it adds to the the story uh in a in a pretty cool way. And so I'm a big fan. But but heavy side layers that is is the one I what by. beat it in, at the Oscars. Do you remember? No, it wasn't they they were so, think and it Universal it was, was so the ashamed. Elton John one. No, Universal <laughs> was, was so nominated. ashamed of the movie that yeah. they withdrew it from Oscar consideration. No. Which yeah. I yeah. like so this is an issue That's, I have with and the, the Elton people John so one, didn't the Elton John song win that year anyway? I don't I don't or was that a different year? The know. one for Rocket I think Man. That, that is the same year. That, that sounds that's the same year. The Rocket Man one. That's the same awesome. screenwriter as Cats. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like Cats was way that. better than Rocket Man. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> well, I liked I mean, Rocket I Man, but I didn't think I, it was there. <laughs> See, this is where, like, this Shine is, where is things... so hardcore. Like, we want to be supportive, but, like, but at, like, so at a certain Shine point, I'm not sure staff? if it's a rational conversation. <laughs> Hold on a second. All right. So, here's something I want to talk about. Here's something I want to talk about. The dis so now we're gonna get into the movie and the thing that comes to mind is James Corden, his his, uh, there's this TMZ clip of him saying you know I've never seen the movie but I heard it's awful sort of like laughing it off I'm like James you signed on to do this movie you're a musical guy you you bent down and put your face in garbage or what was supposed to be garbage. Like there, it's not like he, he was going to be surprised later. It, it, it's not like, you know what he was like performing Elba who didn't know what they were going to do to his man parts. Right. Like they're like, James, look like you're eating garbage. Right. <laughs> and then afterwards he's like, Oh no, this movie's so shameful. You don't hear Dame, Dame Judy Gent say anything bad about cats. I don't think. No, she's like cats was awesome when I was young, and this is great. You don't hear Ian McKellen. They had again. He licked milk out of a saucer, right? You don't hear Ian McKellen talking trash about cats. And he killed it. And and, and he he's did a perfect Gus the theater. He he even said how much he likes the movie. Ex- oh, there you go. See, I've never. I, I haven't. 
Class um, act, yeah. It, class act. And I think that like Universal chickening out of that song just further, re- like, yes, it was a bomb, but they could have leaned into it and they could have, like, it could have been more. They could have owned it a lot more. And and uh, that always bummed me out that they didn't put that song song forward and it's part of in general how frustrated i am that there are there are, that the actors i mean look the movie's not perfect and i'll ask you some questions about that okay uh lily you had some questions about the movie no not about the movie about the podcast <laughs> oh wait i thought you had questions about the movie all right fine oh i'm oh, I mean, about the movie i have tons of questions but i don't know if we have so time ask, for all that ask the guests why are about- their heads so small like here's <laughs> the thing like i was just recently re-watching it and i just I'm like, I was trying to see it from a perspective of somebody who maybe didn't like it, like who wasn't into it. And maybe that's not a good idea because there's too much going on to maybe criticize. And one of the things that I like, my issue is that I love the theater and the Broadway show so much. Like seeing it that, like Becky was saying, like when I was eight in New York in that theater, I, like my mind was so blown that you know it was hard to see other Broadway shows after and I've been very lucky to see a bunch but you know that's sort of like first time part of me kind of wish they just did the theater play but like cooler and better do you know what I mean as if they like filmed it on like a cool stage the way Hamilton was done recently that would have been a just... smart thing to do, do you... okay so sure. that was one of Basically, that was one of my main questions. Do you think that this should never have been made this way, but it would have worked to do sort of like a Hamilton where they kind of, that like weird 90s DVD we can retire and sort of like redo that with like, invest more, even more money in the makeup and the costumes, maybe some stuff. And like, and and like do you need big stars? Like, it, right, like, like when you go see Broadway shows, you it's don't not like care. You, it's not like Idris and, Elba is going to be on stage in Broadway for you to watch. Like, that's right and why do you need these stars do you did that improve it did that improve the experience and by the time i saw hamilton on disney plus um obviously i didn't go to new york to see it but um and i enjoyed it i thought it was awesome like i the fact that those people are now famous didn't matter to me like it they were so good and so when i went back and watched rebel wilson i was like i don't know if you guys were fans of her in the movie i was like absolutely dan's like why why is she why was she cast as like just because she's famous i was like she can sing but like she can't sing sing and and then so that was one of the things that like recently I was I was thinking about. I was like, do you approve of a version that's sort of like a filming of a theater production that's done super, super well as opposed to this movie? Like, I mean, look, I'm so glad the movie exists. And I think it's, I don't, I, I don't think it's a perfect movie by any means, but like it's wonderfully messy. And, and I think that time is going to view, I think with time, people are going to view it as such. Um, so I'm glad the movie exists, but yeah, I mean, I think the safer choice certainly would have been to do something that was similar to the 1998 uh, right. DVD. Like, I, I think that sure. it was just very ambitious that, you know, one of the things I don't think that really thought through was the um, actual like visual perspective in terms of like the scale of things. Like those sets are very complicated that they did in the movie. And while I enjoyed watching them in the movie, because you kind of always fantasize, I, I mean, I always fantasize what, these cats like what where they went and what it looked like because in stage you just see this you know all that garbage and stuff that it's on the stage set but to like see the the um, the film and like it's actually I, f- I think it's like quite beautiful all the like set stuff that they did but then when you see those like very tiny cats and then very large cats it's just kind of seems like it's just too ambitious um at that point and did not land for most people which i understand uh but that was really my only question about the film i have other questions shy is that a question lily I I yes like just if they would have preferred i think, preferred, like just... I think they <laughs> I, if they would have not or if they approve maybe buried in there version. was a question i'm not sure where it was but it was a good of, a, a, of a filmed like if we could get and they said yes yeah, theater version yes that's my question yeah. Yeah. what do you think i don't for for me the 1998 version I don't have a problem with that version. I think let's keep no, no, no. that as the film yes. theater version. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. But I agree. There's a medium there. Like, it's more like, let's not do the CGI. Let's do it as a film with the sets. that they, Even the sets that they built were pretty incredible. Yeah. But let's agreed. do it with no CGI, just with a really, really great makeup. 
And costumes. And costumes. And shoot it in a way that highlights the dancing. The, one of the big problems ah, for me with the I film, agree. you have these incredible dance numbers, the Jellicle Ball, and they're, it's all close-ups and quick edits, and you, right. nowhere do you get this scale of this Such incredible dance point. number that, that, that you get in the show. I don't know. It just feels like the people making these movies, their priorities are just like slightly off. Like to prioritize CG and big stars over practicals and focusing on the craft of what makes cats so magical. It's like if they had just done their second choice, like, I don't know. Well, well, Becky, I have have a question for you because you said you're in film production and I don't know what aspect of film production you work in, but I mean, it just based on your own experience in the industry i mean is that what you think happens that in my, in my in my experience um in my experience the the it's like, like obviously it's not universal but basically like he's trying not to insult i'm trying not to with. insult <laughs> anyone but essentially like in and I can't speak for how it happened on the film, but do you work for it, Universal? No, I don't. I don't at oh, all. Okay. I don't at all. I I I'm, I mainly work in in nonfiction. Uh, my husband works in animation, um, and, and, but uh, but my it's that you you have a director with a very very strong vision, and if people trust that director and trust that vision, then the chances of a, of a great execution are much more likely. But when there is lack of trust and that director does not have enough power, then whatever the brain trust is that's ushering a film through the process, and on films that are hundreds of millions of dollars, there are big brain trusts, typically. People who get to all have notes and comments, it becomes oftentimes what what is, this, what is believed to be the safer version. And, um, and then instead of half instead of like certain things being executed really really well and maybe other things being a flop it's just kind of like everything is just executed in a subpar way i don't know so i to me it speaks of too too much and i don't know if it's studio involvement but too much involvement by many people trying to make it better but then a of singular vision gets diluted. So, I mean, that's what I would think, but I don't know. That's I, I, the opposite I, interpretation. That actually. he had such a vision, he had such a strong vision and everyone supported it, which could be. Yeah. Not know. necessarily that everyone supported it, but just, it's more like he had such a strong vision and then maybe the, whoever was in charge of. He, they put too much trust in would, would say, hey, Tom, you know, maybe we should think about doing it this way. He's like, no, 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 I, I got it. We had to do it this way. It could be. I mean, that, I, I, that could be. So I, I'm with, I, I'm overall with Dan. I'm guessing on... the casting, though, was a stu- like is a studio thing. Well, but, no, but remember, he's an Oscar winner. That. He did Les Mis and did a, arguably a good job. There's like some people who don't like that, but it's a good version of that story. And he won for the King's Speech. But I think the thing that we've never seen Tom Hooper do is anything with special effects, like true special special effects. And I, my feeling is that he had this vision, but he sort of outkicked his coverage. Like he he went and the, and then the budget was not going to keep up with what he actually wanted to do. That's that's my theory. Um, yeah, special effects, and I'll add to that dance. And well, I, and I'll and, and and I'm with Dan. If I were to, I've I, my, my pitch for redoing this movie is that if I was going to do this. Uh, if I was going to do this, I would have like doubled down on dance and dancers and like no stunt doubles and like things like that and made it about that. Because when you see cats in person, um, I flew to, I went to, we have a good friend who's a big Taylor Swift fan. And I went to visit Becky and I got us front row tickets to see it in Costa Mesa in California. And we got like got off the plane and we went to see it just because I was like, you got to see this because I don't want, I don't want you to just see the movie and everyone's going to hate the movie. And so, um, but when you see the dancers like doing their thing and you realize like having seen cats that first time, I thought all Broadway shows were supposed to have that much dancing and that much singing. It was like a huge letdown other Broadway shows. I was like, wait, where's the, where's the dancing? Um, but I don't know. I, I think, I, I think it is definitely important for the director or the filmmakers or whoever it is to surround themselves with a really strong team of people to either, support their vision 
or bring out the best version of that vision. So I, I think I see something like this and I go, I just don't feel like it had a very good team behind it because he clearly was aiming for something, but it got it got lost in translation between what was in his mind and what was in the budget. And there are people, it's people, there are certain people with their very specific job to make that translation between what a director wants and what your time and money allows. Mm-hmm. And that's a really important thing. So I don't know, I feel like it's probably more of a I see more of a producing fail than a directing fail. But but and it could be in, maybe in, t- Tom in those Hoover areas, as a producer like, and not as a director. Yeah. Uh, Be- Becky should. I mean, Becky works in now. She works for like a, a sound production company, and they do a lot of sound stuff. And I remember when we went to see the movie, um, the the mix. I don't know if you all talked about this on the show or if you picked it up, but the mix on Rum Tum Tugger in the movie versus the mix on Rum Tum Tugger on the soundtrack. Like in the movie, it's like they suddenly were like oh no, we're going to have a bunch of like grown people bathing in milk. Let's just turn all the dials down. And like, like it's like Becky, Becky called it a self-conscious mix. And then yeah. when you listen to the album version of it, it rocks. You hear the bass and you hear the groove yeah. that's in that song. And, and that's sort of where, that's kind of where I am on, on those things. Um, tell us a little bit more about just your thoughts on the movie. I, I by the way, I love it. And I'm like, EJ, I'm grateful it exists. Like, I'm just so happy that there is a Cats movie and something different than what already existed and time will be kind to it. So I agree with you there, but other thoughts on the film? Is there anything else that you want people to know about the film or that you loved, loved, loved about it or hated about it? It's just hard to streamline our thoughts because we spent like... Eight hours. Yeah, there's, 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 yeah, there's, so, there's okay. so much I can say. I, I'm happy to get more specific. What did you think of the Mistopheles as opposed to being an enigmatic, non-speaking character to being the the character that that you sort of like the sort of like nerdy guy who gets the girl character? Oh, we hated it. I mean, I hate it. it they made him straight. Oh, like, what's the point of that? You, like, that seemed mm-hmm. to me the most like cynical Hollywood choice of all. To make oh, interesting, this yeah. fabulous gay character, clearly gay character, who just seals the show into like a nerdy, unassuming, like nebbishy Woody mm-hmm. Allen archetype straight that's guy, just, yeah. and translate that, that over so, into cats, like that's insane. So when you say it that way, it re- I don't feel like point. the people who hated the movie were making that point, but that's a really that's a really good point. I when I but when I, I feel did- like those are the reasons that if people are unhappy with the movie, those should be the reasons, not the reasons like, that all these critics yeah. give. It's like get to the heart of if this is right. like a key thing that makes the cat's show and the cat's story so interesting or draws you in or different. Then like, why would you ruin that? for the movie and like wash it out and just turn him into this like character we've seen before so many times. Like that's a good I, criticism. I, I, I will say when I've gone on to defend the movie on other podcasts to people who were not going to get into the depths that we are. And I explained to them how like that gives it a narrative thread that the play doesn't have. And if you're going to make it into a movie that you're expecting people to go to and expecting a plot, at least there's more there and more character, like sort of more development there. So I, I, I saw it as a strength until EJ just laid that out for me right now. And now I'm, I'm saying now you're that. questioning it. See, yeah, this but, but I'd rather, hear, you have a I'd rather hear that from subject. EJ than, than someone who just says, Oh my God, th- this movie makes no sense. Um, I agree ter- with you that the, the, the criticisms of the, of the movie were almost all, my reaction to almost all of them were just, what were you expecting? <laughs> That's exactly. What were you expecting? What did you think this was going to be? Right. And why do other movies get a pass? Like, I don't know if you saw like Joker, right? So like, I, like, yeah. <laughs> I thought Joker was an experiment in misery. It and, was and awful. It, it, it was awful. Dan the- liked it. The, I did like it. The, 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 <laughs> the score of that movie is this is is basically just the Yom Kippur prayers. It is <laughs> so and it was around the same time. It's just like a miserable movie. And it kind of has a plot, but like does it make that much more sense than cats? Like Shy's it's all favorite game is that if any movie comes out that like the, the plot is questionable, he's like, Oh, but that's okay. What about cats? Like constantly on this. <laughs> and we talk about a lot of different things on this podcast with a lot of different people, but somehow it always comes back to cats. Yeah, he he was meant to be, he was meant to meet the two of you. Um, he was meant to be. 
<laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. I'm with you completely. I don't understand how you could like Joe Grun dislike cats, but that's a frame of mind. <laughs> that's like, I don't even understand. It. Like, how can you be a human being and think like that? Like, how can you and I be of the same species and you like Joker and think cats is bad? Like, it's just so foreign to me. Yeah, I have I have many friends who definitely view Joker as high art and and look down on me or question me for the affection for cats and and my peer and just how excited I was to go see it. Like when cats came out, Shai, didn't I just have a baby when cats came out? Becky had a baby. I had like a newborn. Before. Becky? No, not four days because I you came to visit me like two, when she was two oh, weeks no, no. old. But I had like just a, had a you just had a, a I like had a newborn. C- you had an emergency yeah. C-section, and it was exactly one month later because your second daughter's born on my birthday, and we were visiting you on Christmas, and like within one day we were at the theater. Scene. Right, like my teeny tiny newborn. You, you left her at home. I remember you. Were we saying. saw the rise of Skywalker <laughs> and cats like back to back. Wow. <laughs> to go see cats, people thought I was crazy. I'm like, all right, well. Um, I would have brought her if I could have. All right. So EJ and Dan, um, are you doing all right on time? I mean, we're, we're getting to the home. We're getting to the sort of end. You guys are all right. Yeah, we're good. Okay. We're good. EJ, you're good. Yeah. Um, if, if we could, uh, do you think we'll be done by like three 30? Oh yeah. 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 We're, 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 oh, okay. we're more or less. We're more or less at the end. I have a chicken parm con. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just, if you could, so we play another game on this show, on our show called Pitch Imperfect, and it's used in a lot of different ways. But lately, I've been liking the idea of people pitching a sequel. So if you could pitch a sequel to the film, specifically the film, so you are, you are hamstrung by Tom Hooper's film for better and for worse. What is your pitch for the sequel? Dan, you're just going to let me speak. No, no, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. You're so like, polite. I could pitch you mine, and you can, and you can evaluate it. I've been thinking about this. Well, when you when you brought it up initially, and you were like, "Think about it," I was because I had never thought about it before. As much as I thought about cats, never has that question crossed my mind. So it's a great question. And my first thought was a really morbid one, so I'm hesitant to even like say it out loud. Go ahead, just let it out. Yeah, <laughs> come on. Out. We, I mean. Are they all in heaven? Are they all in the heavy side layer? My first thought like was lost, like a, they're all dead. <laughs> cr- yeah, actually, that was kind of <laughs> like a crime noir where people are, um, where some detective is trying to figure out why there's just corpses and corpses of dead cats, like piled uh, up, like mounting behind this uh, bookstore building where the movie takes place. <laughs> is it a cat detective or a human detective? Human detective. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Why are right. there all these dead cats, like <laughs> piles and piles of dead cats here? And then he has to figure out like the backstory and oh, it's this like ritualistic suicide. That's actually it would make a lot of money. Clearly, I should clearly work in development film. I <laughs> I gotta tell right. you, I, that's that's <laughs> interesting. I love that take. See, I just like the idea of bending the cats verse around. Like so, like in my I, I mean, my my pitch, my last pitch was, uh. McCavity, right? He doesn't die. He ends up on the top of that tower, comes back, offs Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy is kind of like your <laughs> Obi Wan Kenobi Force Ghost kind of character. Um, and they have now have a leadership crisis, right? So it's essentially the plot of Transformers, the movie from 1986. And <laughs> um, there's like a little bit of a hero's journey as to who's going to end up being. And then some of the the cats that didn't get songs, your Alonzos, your Monka Straps, they get to introduce themselves and make the case as opposed to just old cats. We're now talking about like younger cats. Um, Maybe argue- one of the kittens. Maybe one of yeah, those and kittens Exactly. Well, that's it. That's your Transformers, the movie analogy, right? Like it's not Ultra Magnus. It's Hot Rod in the end. So you, maybe it's maybe it's Syllabub slash Jemima that ends up in charge. You know, who knows? Um, and then I also have my like, you know, X-Men spin where it's like Fast and the Furious, like the cats are just called in to fight evil somehow, like an Avengers situation. <laughs> and and they, you know, that they each have a, like a power or something. And, you know, that, that like, so it, it leaves the review, you know, introduction thing and is just more of like a, your standard superhero type thing. So, so I've given you now a lot of room, Dan. What's okay, your sequel? So, so my sequel is... Um, McCavity teams up with the Pollicle dogs. Oh, all right. Um, because you know, originally there were supposed to be dogs in this musical, too. So, so right. like Scar and the hyenas, 
Yes. In Lion King. Got it. Yes. So he's got this army of pollicles behind him. And mm. um, again, he's still, you know, I don't know. He, he already stole Old Deuteronomy. So maybe it's got to be something else besides that. Maybe like he steals the, the, um, the tire that Grizabella ascends to the heavy side layer in. Oh, okay. And they have to go, so they have to go um, get it back from him. And so, you know, all, the, all your favorites, Alonzo, Monkestrap, Rum Tum Tugger, are involved with fighting this battle against the Pollicles and stealing about the tire. Very, very cool. I like would that. You, that's, you, that's, you you introducing new interesting characters. So, so I liked I liked the nod to, was it Growl Tiger and Griddlebone? Although they kind of did them dirty. They've done them dirty since the eight because we haven't seen them in the play. Would right. you bring back Growl Tiger? Not oh, the yeah, offensive yeah. parts of the Growl Tiger song. Not the... No, not the... Yeah, yeah. Not, not, the def- not, not the dated offensive parts of the Growl Tiger song. Would you definitely bring back not Growl that Tiger part. for that? Absolutely, yeah. Bring back Growl Tiger, Peaks and Pollicles, all that stuff. Okay. Very cool. Well, uh, we are in the final moments of the show. Um, we are so grateful for EJ and Dan. Again, now that I know that they've received many emails from people, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm wanting glad, to talk heads. I'm not glad. Many, not many, just like you said, specifically like grown men. Like there have been a couple, there have been a couple 40 <laughs> year old men who have slid into my DMs being like, I would absolutely love to be on the show. And I mean, we really developed the podcast. Like it was, it was seriously just like because our significant others like just wanted us to shut up about it. Like we didn't think anybody would listen. So it blows our minds and we love that people listen to it. So wait, so I qualify as a DM slider. I, this is a like a generational thing because I did actually DM you originally. Um, yes, I think you oh, do qualify. I, but wait, but, I mean, I'm I hope go it says something nice Jellicle about you that. Spiral after this episode. No, but I hope it says something nice about you that that despite you know, be, I mean, not that that EJ and Dan agreed to come on our pod and and well, chat with you. I didn't and, really try and, to and preface say, that we were normal one of the people. one of the first things that you guys state at the in the first episode is you go like you're like we are normal people. EJ, you're like <laughs> I I have I'm married. I have a child. I am normal. And but <laughs> but you know, here's a whole. Wait, can can I just that, say so um, shy about, is normal. <laughs> can I can I just say about your podcast that um I I mean my favorite episode is is the second episode where you guys uh really break down and get into the creation like of the play of, of the musical and like all that backstory and I and EJ amazing that you read the Andrew Lloyd Webber book um and and all that but but to me I, you guys together is like magic there's something I so highly enjoyed listening to the two of you. And I don't, I, I'm really going to say that I don't uh, have a lot of time to listen to podcasts. I don't often, I'm not able to. She definitely like, doesn't listen to this one. Yeah, so. I, I'm like often just like running around and, and, and whatever. And so, and Becky, and I, I knew you guys were going to come on. And it was very exciting. And, and Becky texts our chat and she's like, no, no, no. Like, you got to listen to this podcast. And I was like, yeah, I know. I know I have to listen for the show. And Becky's like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Like you just so good just for life. That has nothing to do with right. the show. And I, so, so like my wreck this week, is just listen to this podcast. It's so enjoyable. Absolutely. And I love your guys rapport. Um, I think that we need a season two, no pressure, but I just really wanted to propose it to you. It can be on any topic that mm-hmm. you want we can we can divert from the cats we can keep going with cats but i really highly enjoyed your guys um shtick if you will uh, i thought That's what to say. It, it, it really was... means a lot because like like thank you because we really we did not expect anybody in a million years to ever but listen to I, this podcast. i think the magic is also like your brutal honesty your sincerity and your like vulnerability even under a pseudonym about this topic was extremely endearing and refreshing um, and a lot of fun. And I also have to say that uh, in that, I think it's in that second episode, Dan, you correct EJ's editing, like writing editing, but like, cause you're listening to her and um, 
And then EJ's like, I can't believe I have to listen to you do that or whatever. <laughs> and that's, I don't know how long you guys have known each other or how you know each other, but that was like on multiple levels, an amazing moment for me because I am an editor and that's what I do. And I appreciated so much that you caught that <laughs> and then like dug in. And I also appreciate how annoyed you were because Shy gets extremely annoyed with me. Um, as I constantly do that to him. So on many levels, this podcast means a lot to me. So thank you guys. Thank you so much. We, we, we really, really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, we've known each other for a long a while now. We've been in college. Like for, we became friends like first year of college. And um, we really just started the podcast because we were doing the podcast, just having a conversation all the time. And Maybe. it was all we could talk about. And really like... EJ's um, husband and my fiance like would they would drive it. It was driving them nuts. It was like so we were like I'm sorry like okay we get it we're gonna take an hour every week and just get it all out then and of course then even though we did the podcast we still kept talking about it and we still talk are, about it. Now, are you guys so. obsessed with anything else at this level? Because Shai has other things he's this obsessed. with. Yeah, let's be I clear. Mean. This is yeah. like one of one I mean I love the show, but like, this this wouldn't rank in my top twenty of things I'm obsessed with. <laughs> Um, uh, just in terms of rabbit holes. Yeah, I would say this is a, it's a fraction of the hours we've spent discussing The Last Jedi. I mean, you still, nothing will come close. (laughs) Years of my life. I love that. I, I, I mean, I, it's, I love, I, I think it's just such a one, like, I, I don't think I have many good traits, honestly, but like, I mean, the one trait that I do, like, and I think it makes me like a decent journalist too, is that like, I become very deeply obsessed with things and, I I don't know. I just always bond with people who have that same quality. Can you share other obsessions that both of you have together or separately? Um, I would say that right now, like the thing that I'm deeply obsessed with is a circle, the Netflix, the Netflix reality. Oh, really? Joe. Um, and thankfully, like, unlike cats, my husband and I are on completely the same page about that. That's good. That's good. We were talking about like circle strategy at like one in the morning last night. (laughs) while we were going to sleep um and um yeah i would highly recommend that people check it out it's it's riveting it's amazing all right the circle wow yeah i've seen it netflix keeps trying to get me to watch it and so do other people i know keep trying to get me to watch it we've got so this is another strong endorsement a big endorsement all right the circle how about, how about you dan is there something you're obsessed with that you love that you want to recommend and shout out um i'm well i'm like ej i'm also kind of an obsessive personality but um and when I was growing up, besides musical theater and music and the music, jazz and all that stuff, it was like um, Lord of the Rings. And yeah, that was my big one when I was younger. But recently, I've just, like many, like, I think very, so many people during the pandemic, I've been rewatching The Sopranos and mm. cannot recommend it enough. If you haven't rewatched it within the last five years, it's just, it's just unbelievable. Wow. All right. The <laughs> Sopranos. Deep cut. Uh, well, not deep cut for us. Like I, we were, we watched it when it was like on the first time, but like, yeah, I don't think folks think about how also a lot of the peak TV we have today wouldn't be here without the Sopranos. Without the Sopranos. Totally. Uh, Lily, what do you recommend? What's your, what's your recommendation? Shout out. So I, I, on the obsession thing, I have recently uh, because Shai recommended something to me that I became quite obsessed with. Um, it's weird. It's a weird show, but um, I, yeah, my obsession's a bit, bit much with it. Um, there's the this amazing writer director named uh, Chris Conrad who made uh, a show. Steve Conrad. That's, that's right. Chris his Conrad's his brother, the right, is the actor. Sorry, Steve Conrad, who made with his brother is the actor on the show. Um, Chris. Uh, a show called Patriot on Amazon Prime. It's super weird. He made another show, uh, which you can get on iTunes or on Epix, uh, which is called Perpetual Grace, which is where I recommend starting. Um, and uh, they write their own music for the show and like get involved in every single detail of the show. And I just thought it was spectacular. Perpetual Grace. And then I went back and I watched Amazon Prime's The Patriot or just Patriot. And, 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 and I believe there's an award that comes along with that on our show. Yes, when... Shai got an I Told You show and I had to call him a genius because I was like, <laughs> yeah, sure. Like I wasn't into it or whatever. I was like, yeah, I'll get to it. And then I watched it and like, wow, um, very much obsessed. Uh, and That's so, the highest honor on our show is if you get Chris an I Told You show. And Chris did agree. Yep. 
to come on our the actor did agree to come on our podcast but now he's like filming some nice. like crazy Marvel things. So hopefully, I don't know um, if it's Marvel. Done. Don't like Nate. Whatever. I want to come what on the is... show. Don't make up random things about it. He's story. filming. He, what is, it's some superhero thing. Um, oh my gosh, sorry. you're gonna have to edit that part, Chai. <laughs> I mean, or not, it's, I'm sure Chris. Gonna... If you're listening, which I'm sure he's not, Lily doesn't um, know what she's talking about. But we are grateful that, that you agreed to <laughs> um, at some point. I I think he's amazing. I think both of them are amazing. And so that was my recent obsession. The super like recommendation i think for people uh, who want to watch something weird but awesome so, yeah. yeah i also watched frozen for the first time with my five-year-old we had not gotten to that okay yet. exactly people love frozen but cats doesn't make sense and i like frozen a lot but i'm just saying but, but i have what? to say like i i watched it and i was like wait is this does do people realize that this is pretty good i was like yeah. and then and then like halfway through i was like this is good and then by the end i was like you know bopping along and i was like i feel like that maybe i i was so exposed to like the oversaturation of it that i did not realize how much like you it didn't actually... have two daughters when the film came out no so it's a different story and so I just have two boys, all right but... becky what oh, we, me, ej's got to eat a sandwich i know okay? i know i'm gonna be EJ's super quick i haven't been watching anything and, and don't worry about my start thing. eating but and i will <laughs> <laughs> Lily eats while we're podcasting all, all the time. Because of the time difference. Well, Lily, it's she has food going in minutes. and food going out to the child that's breastfeeding. Both of them breastfeed. I the haven't time. nursed while we podcasted in many months. Just to be, I mean. I'm I not complaining it. about it. Straight, I'm just but... saying no one should feel bad about eating. Uh, Becky, what do what adults do you, or babies? Um, I actually recommend? haven't. I haven't watching been watching um, anything new. Um, so I, I'm just gonna. We watched an oldie but a goodie this last week. We we we, we rewatched uh, Miyazaki's uh, Kiki's Delivery Service with my with my three year old and Shy's kids, and that was like that was just like a they really loved it. They loved it. Uh, Kiki's Delivery Service. Yeah, um, I have a four-year-old, so I'm always looking for recommendations. Oh, we like well, we like we love like if I don't know if you've shown your your kid my neighbor Totoro, no. but um that's a really special one. Um so so my neighbor Totoro and Kiki's liver service, they're they're both uh by Miyazaki's got so many. And Miyazaki so many is so beautiful and little kids oh, yeah. connect to it in a way that is because I remember taking my kids to see them and when they show them in the theater, they usually show them a couple times a year in the theaters too. And I, as an adult, I think they're cool, but there's something about the way Miyazaki makes those films that kids are just like I, I recommend starting with Totoro as your as your first one and like as the as the entry into that world, and then you can explore all the studio ghibli films but but definitely totoro would be the one to start with so we we regularly put those on through rewatch that this past week um yeah um that's all i don't have i don't have anything well i want to recommend to ej and dan because i know i've made my sisters watch this it's like a few minutes long but there's this brilliant um comedian writer her name is jessica amal and she used to be part of the uh, comedy group um, call, and I'll send you this in an email afterwards, uh, Fembot PhD, who we love on our show. And she does a, she has a sketch online, Cat's a One Person Show. Miss, 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 Mr. Mistopheles, the Rum Tum Tug, or the Rum Tum Jellicle Cat. And like I said, I love a good pat, Cat's parody because it can only be done by someone who truly loves cats in a certain way. And so I recommend that. And, uh, and, and she's, awesome so check that out um I'll, I'll tell everybody as i continue on this journey of crazy ex-girlfriend i know three episodes to go ali and i have been watching oh yeah okay. that's and what i've been watching that to you told me to watch too. drop another term on the show is i am extraordinarily show emotional about the fact that i'm in the in the home stretch there's three episodes left i am going to be so sad when it's over but at the same time i'm extremely stressed out because i don't know how it's going to end talk about I, I get very invested in the ships and like, I have strong feelings about how anything. I want this to go. And there's no sign as to how it's going to be resolved. And so I'm kind of freaking out. We got three episodes to go. Uh, it's amazing. And the Cats episode is genius. Like the Cats episode is like the perfect example of amazing Cats parody. Yeah. Um, uh, that's great. So I'm freaking out about that. And then with mom and dad last night, because they're visiting, because our house is basically a kibbutz now, um, uh, we watched the 1986 Brian Brown classic, FX, which is actually aged really well, um, uh, which is about a special effects guy who gets wrapped up in a murder plot. It's cool. Um, I love that movie as a kid. All right. And, and now we'll wrap the show just by quickly going around and saying where people can follow you. EJ, 
again, I know people can follow you on rollingstone.com, but do you want anybody to follow you or follow any other things? Sure, you can follow me on Twitter at EJ Dixon. All right, at EJ Dixon. Dan, you do you want to like remain mysterious? Do you want people to like check out your music or no, you can check me out. So you can you cannot find Dan Alexander anywhere, but you could follow <laughs> the real me, Dan Stein, at Dan Stein Bass on Instagram. Awesome. Cool. I will. I love oh, the music. Get it. All right now. And Becky, where can people follow you? At paper BK Princess on Twitter. And Lil. You can follow me at Chi Chi C H I C H I K Gomez on Twitter and Clubhouse, Lily Corman on Clubhouse. And oh, yeah. you can follow me at Pancake for Table, Pancake and the Number Four Table on Twitter and Instagram. All of the Friday Night Movie shenanigans at Friday Night Movie on Twitter and Instagram. Please join us in checking out and supporting. The Endel ACP Legal Defense Fund, the Equal Justice Initiative, the Asian American Journalists Association, all organizations that our family is supporting regularly and are doing amazing, important things for our country and democracy. And uh, with that, the theme music will kick in. It doesn't really kick in, guys. It comes in post-production, but just imagine it. It's by What Does It Eat? And uh, thank you so much to our guests, EJ Dixon and Dan Alexander, also Dan Stein Bass for being here and talking cats and other things. Thank you so much.